So we are on day seven of our Bible in a Year series, and we are going to cover Genesis chapter 19, 20, and 21. We're going to go over the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as look at the actual today's uh, today relevant information that pertains to it. There's evidence that uh, it was destroyed. We're also going to go over uh, uh, the birth of Isaac, as well as Hagar and Ishmael being sent away, not necessarily in that order. So before we get started, let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to study your words with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I pray that you go before each and every single one of us, Lord, and bless our minds. Open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears so that we can hear things and see things the way that you have intended for them to be seen. Open the mysteries of your word so that we may interpret it the way that you have intended for it to be interpreted. Lord, I pray that you bless every single person on this uh, that's participating in this Bible study right now, Lord. I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let us go to, oh, let's see, let's go here. Okay, so we are on chapter 19. So right here, chapter 19, the two angels entered Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in Sodom's gateway. Now when Lot saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed with his face to the ground and said, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house, wash your feet and spend the night. Then you can get up early and go on your way. So there had to be some sort of evidence that they were angels just from looking at them. They had to have some sort of indicator that they were angels because Abraham did the same thing. He saw the three men from afar and he knew that this was kind of the situation. So they said, no, they said, we would rather spend the night in the square. But he urged them to so strongly, he urged them so strongly that they followed him and went into his house. He prepared a feast and baked unleavened bread for them and they ate. And this reminds me of that Bible verse that say uh, that essentially says some have entertained angels unknowingly. So it's always one. It's always good to try to extend your hospitality to others. OK, and I'm not saying like have unwanted people like unwanted family members. I'm not talking about that. I'm like, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population surrounded the house. Now, this is Lot's house. They called out to Lot and said, where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out so that we can have sex with them. So they had to be have been attractive, beautiful in some capacity. They were angels. And so they were probably divinely made. And these men of Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom wanted to basically have like this orgy with them. They wanted to have like this, the, this, you know, situation where they just kind of, they all had sex with them. So Lot went out to them and at the entrance and shut the door behind them. He said, don't do this evil, my brothers. Look, I've got two daughters who haven't been intimate with a man. I'll bring them out to you. You can do whatever you want to them. Now, I thought this verse was very interesting because it shows that he's willing to sacrifice his own, his own daughters. Um, in exchange for helping these angels, these messengers of God, however God spares their daughters. He says, however, don't do anything to these men because they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of the way, they said, adding, this one came here as an alien, but he's acting like a judge. Now we'll do more harm to you than to them. They put pressure on Lot and came up to break down the door, but the angels reached out, brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the entrance of the house, both young and old, with blindness, so that they were unable to find the entrance. Then the angel said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, a son-in-law, your sons and daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people is so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So, and this shows you right here, because the outcry against its people is so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Your sins will testify against you. The, the, the outcry of who you've wronged will, will testify against you. And this is exactly what's happening. The outcry against its people, the people are crying out, crying out to God, is so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law, his sons-in-law. Um, who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said, get out of this place for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. 
So at daybreak, the angels urge Lot on, get up, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated because the Lord's compassion for him. The men grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. They brought him out and left him outside the city. As soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, run for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Run to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, please, your servant has indeed found favor with you and you have shown me great kindness by saving my life, but I can't run to the mountains. The disaster will overtake Overtake me and I'll die. Look, this town is close enough for me to flee to. It is a small place. Please let me run to it. It's only a small place, isn't it? So that I can survive. And he said to him, all right, I'll grant your request about this matter too and will not demolish the town you mentioned. Hurry up, run to it, for I cannot do anything until you get there. So there's an appointed time for everything and there's a lot of things that have to take place before things happen. Therefore, the name of the city is Zor. So the name of the I cannot do yeah. So therefore, the name of the city is Zor. So the sun has risen over the land when Lot reached Zor. Then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulfur from the Lord. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the city, and whatever grew on the ground. But Lot's but Lot's wife looked back. And became a pillar of salt. And I think I think this is like really, really important because whenever we look back at, at, first, first at something, we go back to something that God has delivered us from. It's like Scripture tells us: whenever you, uh, whenever a demon is cast out, and they, they find you unclean, and kept seven more come back. Now this isn't directly related, but it's kind of like parallel. She looked back at something that God was told her not to look back to. Don't go back to that. And when she looked back at that essentially disobeying God, it, it, it was detrimental to her. She was utterly destroyed, turned into a pillar of salt. And I think something that's really interesting is about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's biblical, there's archaeological evidence that it existed and that it was indeed destroyed by sulfur. And I'm going to share that video with you really quick by the grace of God. I think this is it. Okay, so bear with me. Let's see. Um, let's see, how do I do this? Okay. So I'm up here on the site uh, called Located in Amara. And this is the site that the archaeologists associated with Gomorrah. So here you can see that at the lowest of subduction and depression, uh, this is full of living pottery. It's full of the fragments of human bones. But what evidence is there of the burning sulfur that rained down? Well, uh, it seems that the culprits are these sulfur balls that are also left in this area. Okay, now there's another part I want to show you guys. Let me see if I can fast forward to it. It is right about, well, maybe you're all right here. I'm sorry, y'all. And this, this is like a really cool, um, 
it's a really cool uh, video. I'll link the description. I'll link it in the description box. And he actually has a really cool channel. It's called Bible Expedition. And he has like a lot of really good stuff on there. So I'll link that down below in the description box as well. But I would definitely check it out and look at some of his stuff. But that particular video is just showing evident that Sodom and Gomorrah was indeed like a real thing. So, okay. Okay, verse 27. Early in the morning, Abraham went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land of the plain, and he saw that smoke was going up from the land like the smoke of a furnace. So it was when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval when he demolished the cities where Lot had lived. Now, Lot departed from Zor and lived in the mountains along with his two daughters. Now, because he was afraid to live in Zor. Now, I think the reason, I don't have like evidence of this, but I think the reason that he was afraid to actually live in Zor was because of like, it was one of the cities that the angels had said that they were going to destroy. And so it could have been just like a psychological, it was also very close to Sodom and Gomorrah. So it was just in proximity. So there could have been a multitude of reasons why he didn't want to live there, but I think it was probably it was probably due to some sort of traumatic event. But instead, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. Then the firstborn said to the younger, our father is old and there is no man in the land to sleep with us, as is the custom of all the land. Come, let's get our father to drink wine so that we can sleep with him and preserve our father's line. So they got their father to drink wine that night and the firstborn came and slept with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the, uh, let's see, the next day, the firstborn said to the younger, look, I slept with my father last night. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight so you can go sleep with him and we can preserve our father's line. That night, they again got their father drunk with wine and the younger went and slept with him and he did not know when she lay down or got up. We're on verse 36. So both last daughter became pregnant by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab, and he is the father of the Moabites of today. And the younger also gave birth to a son, and she named her son Benami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. And the Moabites and the Ammonites, that's basically in modern day Jordan. So that's where that kind of comes from. So from there, Abraham traveled to the region of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Now, while he was staying in Gerar, Abraham said about his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. So King Ambalek, Abimelech of Gerar had Sarah brought to him. Now, mind you, like Sarah's old at this point. She's like 100 years old and they're still lusting and thirsting after her. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, you are about to die because of the woman you have taken for she is a married woman. And I think this right here, this verse just really kind of sticks out to me because how many people have we invited into our lives, into our beds that are, we don't know what type of covenant they have. And by default, if we become one with that person, we are now in covenant with the covenant that they're in. So she was already married. And so God's telling him basically a part of the covenant that she's a part of. If you sleep with her, if you're with her, you're going to die. And not just you, but the others in proximity, like those that are near and dear to you. We're going to get to that in, in the next verse. But I think that's really interesting because we can relate to that today. The people that we invite into our lives intimately. If you're not married and you're out dating whoever, you know, don't fornicate. Please don't do that. Like, just don't do that. Don't just don't. But if you're out doing whatever you want, sleeping with whoever you want, you're becoming in a covenant with that person, a blood covenant, and you have no idea who they've been with, who they've slept with, what type of covenant they've been with, you know, like the person that they slept with, what kind of covenants they were with. I mean, it's just, it becomes like this, just this astronomical mess. And so I thought that was really interesting. But anyway, um, verse four, now Abimelech had not approached her so he said, Lord, would you destroy a nation even though it is innocent? Didn't he himself say to me, she is my sister? And her, she herself said, he is my brother. I did this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Then God, or in verse six, then God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this with a clear conscience. I have also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I have not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife 
for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who are yours. Okay, so these are his servants. These are his children. These are every single thing that belongs to him, his other wives, all that belong to him. Earlier in the morning, Abimelech got up, called out his servant, called all his servants together and personally told them all these things. And the men were terrified. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said to him, what have you done to us? This reminds of uh, back whenever he, he lied the first time about Sarah being his sister in, um, in Egypt and all the this, all this stuff started happening to him. And now we see him doing the same thing. He's repeating himself again. He said, how did I sin against you that you have brought such enormous guilt on me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that should have never been done, never be done. Abimelech also asked Abraham, what made you do this? And Abraham replied, I thought there is absolutely no fear of God in this place. They will kill me because of my wife, because she is really my sister, the daughter of my father, though, not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So when God had me, when God had me wander from my father's house, I said to her, show your loyalty to me wherever we go and say about me, he is my brother. So he, in theory, he wasn't lying. Then Abimelech took flocks and herds and male and female slaves, gave them to Abraham and returned his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, look, my, father, my land is before you. Settle wherever you want. And he said to Sarah, look, I'm giving your brother 1,000 pieces of silver. It is a verification of your honor to all who are with you. You are fully vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female slaves so that they could bear children. For the Lord had completely closed all the wombs in Abimelech's household on the account of Sarah, Abraham's wife, on the account of someone that he had, that was in his house that he didn't even know what type of covenant she was in, who, who, what God she prayed to. He didn't know any of this stuff. And be just by default, everybody in, in that kingdom, everybody, um, um, everybody had like in his household had their wombs closed off the women completely closed off. They were not going to bear any children. When he said, when God said that you will surely die, he meant that you were going to die and there were, you were not going to have any descendants. Everybody was going to die. Okay. Chapter 21. So the Lord came to Sarah as he said, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the point at, at the appointed time, God had told him. So sometimes it seems like things are not happening. When it's delayed, it, it's, it's delayed. Not, it's not a no, it's just a not yet. And so this was the situation here. At the appointed time, God had told him. Abraham named his son who was born to him, the one Sarah bore to him, Isaac. When his son Isaac was eight years old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. I'm sorry, when, uh, when Isaac was eight days old, not eight years old. Sarah said, God has made me laugh. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. She also said, who would have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have born a son for him in his old age. The child grew and was weaned and Abraham held a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son mocking the one Hagar, the Egyptian had born to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, drive out this slave with her son for the one for the son of this slave will not be co-heir with my son, Isaac. Now, this was very distressing to Abraham because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed about the boy and about your slave. Whatever Sarah says to you, listen to her because your offspring will be traced through Isaac. And I will also make a nation of the slave's son because he is your offspring. Early in the morning, Abraham got up, took bread and a water skin, put them on Hagar's shoulder and sent her on, sent her and the boy on their way or sent her and the boy away. She left and wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. When she, when the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes and went and sat at a distance about a bow shot away. For she said, I can't bear to watch the boy die. While she sat at a distance, she wept loudly. So he's about, 
he's about 14 at this point because he was 13 when he got circumcised and that was like a year ago and that was around the time that the angels had came to uh tell sarah that she was going to have a child so verse 17 god heard the boy crying and the angel of god called to hagar from heaven and said to her what's wrong hagar don't be afraid for god has heard the boy crying from the place where he is get up help the boy up and grasp his hand for i will make him a great nation then god opened her eyes and then and she saw well so she went and filled the water skin and gave the boy a drink god was with the boy and he grew he settled in the wilderness and became an archer he settled in the wilderness of paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of egypt now at that time abimelech accompanied by phicol the commander of his army said to abraham God is with you in everything you do. Swear to me by God here and now that you will not break an agreement with me or with my children and descendants as I have been loyal to you. So you will be loyal to me and to the country where you are a resident alien. And Abraham said, I swear it. But Abraham complained to Abimelech because of the well that Abimelech's servants had seized. Abimelech replied, I don't know who did this thing. You didn't report anything to me, so I hadn't heard anything about it. So you see this, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. He's complaining about it, but he never said anything about it. He just groaned about it. Verse 27, Abraham took flocks and herds and gave them to Abimelech. And the two of them made a covenant. Abraham separated seven ear lambs from the flock. And Abimelech said to Abraham, why have you separated these seven ear lambs? And remember, seven is a sign of completion. Seven, he replied, you are to accept the seven ewe lambs from me so that this act will serve as my witness that I dug this well. Therefore, that place will, uh, will that, pl that place was called Beersheba because it was there that the, it was there that the two of them swore an oath. Verse 32, after they had made a covenant at Beersheba, Abimelech and Baikal, the commander of his army, left and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree a tam tamarisk tree, I think I said that right, in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and Abraham lived as an alien in the land of the Philistine for many days. Now I said many days, not many years, many days. So that is the end of our, uh, our, our session today, our study today. I really hope that this really bless somebody. If you have any any revelations or if anything stood out to you or you thought anything was interesting, please don't hesitate to comment and leave it in the comment section. Um, I love reading your comments. I find them very interesting. Some of you guys have pointed out stuff that I didn't even see. So I think that's really interesting. Um, not really interesting, but I just, I love it. Like I, I thrive off of this stuff. So, but anyway, um, I really hope that this is a blessing to you. Um, I really pray that you guys have a wonderful evening and if you found this video helpful at all, give us a thumbs up. If you want to see similar content, subscribe, and I will see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Blessings.